Hello everyone. Today's Monday. It's our second day of Advent. And so if you're lighting candles, relight the one that you did yesterday and keep that lit while you do your reading and praying and memorizing and however long you want to keep it going. Okay, so today we're going to be delving into scripture in more of a Bible study format. And that's what we're going to do every Monday through Friday. So let's get into it. Today we're going to be looking mostly in the Old Testament and mostly at the words of Isaiah. However, before we get there, we're going to talk a little bit about Samuel and then later we'll touch a little bit into Matthew too. So we're going to be looking at the prophets. So Isaiah and Samuel were prophets. These are people that received a message from God and gave them the message to the people of God. Okay, so some that are familiar to you might be Jonah with Jonah and the whale, or um, maybe even Daniel, who gave a prophecy during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, there's quite a few prophets in the Bible. And so today we're going to start with Samuel, even though our focus scripture will be in Isaiah. So we're going all the way back to when Israel had kings. Okay, so their first king was King Saul. And the people asked for a king, um, and God gave them one, and it was Saul. He was the basically the, the epitome of what you would want as a king. He looked amazing, he was strong, all the things, and he became very prideful, and he was disobedient to God, and lots of drama went down, and God finally said, you know what, Saul, your family line is not going to last. I'm going to give the, the kingship to a different line of people. And so that meant that King Saul's son, Jonathan, was not going to take the throne when Saul died. Now, Saul's still living, and God tells Samuel to go out and find this king, okay? And so Samuel goes through all of this stuff um, to find the king, and God's like, nope, not him, not him, not him, not him. He finally gets to David, and David is the one. Now, David is the opposite of Saul, not somebody that you would expect to be king. He was the youngest. He was kind of maybe a little bit scrawny, although he was pretty tough because he fought off lions and bears to protect the sheep, and he killed Goliath later on and all sorts of other things. But from the people's point of view, David was not maybe the best of the best to be picked here. But this is who God wanted. And he told Samuel, I see into the heart of men where men only look on the outside. And so we know that God chose David because of his heart. Now, Saul wasn't real excited about this, but not too much he can do. And so after a lot of fighting, palace intrigue, murder, mayhem, you know, Saul dies. Then there's more murder and mayhem and craziness going on and David's king. And he finally decides that he wants to build a temple for the Lord. And God responds to David's desire to do this through the prophet Samuel, the same prophet who anointed David king many years prior. Okay, and so this is what we're going to read out of 2 Samuel 7, 4 through 17. Okay, but the same night, the Lord of the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. 
When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, when the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke this to David. So as we can see, God told David, you know what? I've been living in a tent for a long time. Did I ask for a temple? No, I didn't. So I don't really want you to do that. But I'm going to promise you something. And he promised quite a bit in here. Part of it harkens back to the promise he made with Abraham to make his people a great people and to give them a land, right? And David is living in this promised land. Um, so he talks a little bit about that, but then he talks about establishing a house. And what that means is the house of David is just like we think of when we think of the monarchies in England, for instance, they have the house of Windsor, right? That's who's in charge right now. Um, this is sign, same thing. So we have a house of David. So David's lineage is going to go on. God's going to establish it. And he promises that even when these kings disobey God and go against God, he's still not going to forsake them the way he did Saul, where he takes it away. Now, that doesn't mean they don't get disciplined. <laughs> um, if you read the Old Testament, there's plenty of that going on. Um, but he doesn't take it away from them. Now, he makes a big claim here, right? He says, forever. And so we can see that all the way through Jesus. Jesus comes from the line of David. Okay. And this is important because who lives forever? Jesus, right? And his kingdom will too. But we'll get to that later on in the week. Okay. So here we are. God is going to establish David's house. This means his descendants will rule over Israel, that God's going to stay with them. He's not going to pull it away from them like he did Saul, right? When Saul disobeyed. And we also see that God's promising that the Messiah is going to come through the line of David. When we say line of David, we mean his descendants, right? So you could literally like draw a line from person to person to person and eventually get back to David. Um, and so we're going to see this even further in Isaiah. And this is our passage that's the focus of today. And I just want you to think about something for a minute. King David was told through Samuel this promise. And what we're going to see is several hundred years later, Isaiah is going to speak to the people of Israel. And this is his words from God. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do that. Now this is Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, several hundred years later. So let's kind of dig into this a little bit. This may be a little familiar to you because the end of it is something that we often sing about in uh, Christmas songs. So this may be a very familiar passage to you. Isaiah is reminding the people of God's promise to David. Now, why would he do that? What is so important that they need to remember this in this moment? When he spoke, Isaiah, he was speaking to the people who were living under the rule of King Ahaz. And King Ahaz was not so great a king. Okay. At this point in time, the Israelites had divided and there was a Northern kingdom and a Southern kingdom. So there's actually kind of two Kings going on and we'll, that's a lesson for a different day. Um, but King Ahaz was not a godly King. He was not obeying God and he was doing quite a bit of wicked stuff. So let's talk about him for a minute. 
He worshipped idols. He sacrificed children to these false gods, to include some of his own. He desecrated the temple. He destroyed the artifacts within it and some of the furniture. He put idol altars all over Jerusalem so that people could worship these these false gods. He even put them in the high places, which are sacred places that are further out of the city for people to worship false gods. And when I say put them in the high places, these oftentimes replaced where people would go to worship the one true God. Um, he made alliances with enemies of the Israelites and the kings were supposed to rely on God only, not on earthly powers. He fought his fellow Israelites. Remember I told you they were split, so they had a lot of going back and forth there. This, this guy was no good, okay? Very evil in the sight of the Lord. And it was under this reign that Isaiah was reminding the people of what God had promised David. They still had reason to hope. For those that had not bought into all of this uh, crazy idol stuff and, and who were upset that the temple of the Lord was being desecrated and treated in such a manner, the ones who were um, begging and asking people to stay true to the Lord, those people, he was saying, look, we still have hope. We have hope because what God promised back here to David. And oh, by the way, let me give you some extra information too. And he ended up giving a little bit more information about the coming Messiah as well. And so let's jump a little forward to Matthew. Okay, so here it is in Matthew. Jesus has been born <laughs> and he's getting ready to start his ministry. We're talking 600 years since Isaiah spoke to these people. Okay, 600 years, it's a long time. Let's read what it says, Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, that's John the Baptist, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did you hear some of the similarities there? They were quoting back to Isaiah. And what this is saying is that here it is at this moment in time, Jesus is starting to fulfill these prophecies. He's fulfilling other ones when he was born and that, but this one specifically going back to what we just read in Isaiah, right? That he um, went to Galilee, that he left Nazareth, he um, into the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. And so that actually fulfilled what Isaiah had said, right? Um, and we see that there. And then this is when Jesus began to preach. Okay, so this is where we see him stepping into his ministry and they were repeating the words of Isaiah from 600 years before. I want you to think about this. King David, a couple hundred years later, Isaiah reminds the people of that prophecy and gives us a little bit more of a hint as to what's to come 600 years later. That's a long time. And these prophecies came true. Here in Matthew, we are seeing the fulfillment of the promise that God gave to his people through Isaiah and through Samuel, okay? So Jesus would start his ministry when verses one and two came to pass. And so here it is, God gave David a promise through Samuel. He was gonna establish the house of David as ruler over Israel and that it would be that way forever. Over 200 years later, Isaiah would remind the people of the promise that David was given and then give a description of the Messiah. And over 600 years after that, the Messiah would fulfill Isaiah's words, God's words through Isaiah. That is amazing. And this is just two sets of prophecies. There are so many more throughout the Bible. So why do we really care about this? And what does this have to do with hope, which is our focus of this week, right? Of this Advent season right now. So God spoke to the people through prophets and it always came true. Always. God speaks to us now through his word and it is true. And we can know his word is true because all the things that he promised, except the ones that are in our future, because they haven't happened yet, all the things he promised have been proven true. Not one of them has been wrong. 
So if it's been time for a prophecy to be fulfilled, it has been fulfilled and it has done so to the nth degree. None of it was wrong. None of it. Because God is not wrong. And because we can see that, we can see, look, these prophecies have come true. What God said really did happen. That gives us hope that we can look at some of the prophecies that have been given to us, right, that have not been fulfilled yet. And we can see the hope in that. We see this is what God has promised us. And I know it's going to happen because everything he has said before has come to fruition exactly as he said it would. And so that's how this relates to our focus of hope today. The things that he has promised his children for the future are amazing. And we will get into that a little bit later this week. And this gives us great hope. We have so much to hope for. And we have so much hope to share with other people. Because unbelievers, if we share with them the gospel and, and they become believers, they get those promises too. This isn't just for a few handful of people, right? This is for anyone and everyone who believes in the name of Jesus. So we need to be sharing that with people. We need to be sharing the hope that we have with others so that they can have that hope too. Because... I'm going to be real honest. The future doesn't look too bright for the people who don't believe. The same promise that God gives to us, he also talks about what happens to those who don't believe. And it's it's not a hopeful situation. So where a lot of people look at the book of Revelation, look at prophecy as gloom and doom, believers can look at it and say, no, there's so much hope there because Jesus is going to set things right and he's going to take his believers to heaven and he's going to give them new bodies and give them new everything, new earth, new heaven. We're going to be in right relationship with God and this is going to be amazing. But that's only for those who believe. And so we have great hope, but it's also a reminder to us that we need to be urgent in telling other people about this hope so that they can share in it as well. All right, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, help us to see the hope we have in you. When our hope dwindles, remind us of all the things that you've promised. Show us how you are steadfast and follow through on all you say. Then show us what is waiting for us when Jesus comes again. Remind us of all you have done so that we can hope in all that you will do. In Jesus' name, amen.